Hello, and welcome to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. As I'm recording this intro, I'm listening to my three-year-old daughter chat with my dad, and she's asking why about everything. She's just so curious, which sometimes, like as I'm listening to it from afar, it's adorable. But when I'm in the thick of it and she asks me why about a million things, I'm like, oh, just because. You know, I find myself turning into my parents. I actually said to her this morning, you better shape up, young lady. It was something like that. (laughs) But I said the word young lady after it. And I was like, oh, Jesus, I've really, I've really turned into my mom. And I guess that's what we all do. Now, there's nothing really new to report from my quarantine. Although, is it really a quarantine if they're opening things? So I'm here in Alabama and they opened the beach. Thank God. We've been twice. We've managed to stay away from people but at the end, so we're like a mile from the beach. We, we drove up and then we used those sprayers to get the sand off us before getting in the car. And then we're on the way home and my husband's like, do you have any wipes? Do you have any wipes? And he's like freaking out because he's like, I touched things that other people touched and uh, got home and he washed his hands <laughs> very thoroughly. Uh, and then we went to the store to get groceries and it's, I'm not going to say where I went, but it's one of those places you can get groceries and some items because we needed some other things. And it's almost like some people think that the corona is just over. We were in line checking out, and instead of this guy going in another aisle, he scooted past us. He squeezed past us to go to the bathrooms. And I just looked at the cashier in disbelief, and we we're both looking in disbelief. And I just don't, I don't understand why people think it's okay to get that close to anyone. Anyway, it worries me. As I keep saying, uh, we'll just see what happens to Georgia, who opened everything early. And we're going to make our decisions based on that. So we'll know in a couple of weeks what it's safe to do, what it's not to do. I mean, I can't imagine. it's not de- The cases aren't declining now. So you can't imagine it getting any better with things op- reopening. And uh, we are still in waiting mode until we decide when we're going on our RV trip. When, not if. <laughs> I'm hoping it's not an if. Now, on to today's guest, which I'm so excited about. Today, I've got on Doug Conant. Let me tell you about him if that name does not ring a bell. Doug Conant is the only former Fortune 500 CEO who is a New York Times bestselling author, a top 50 leadership innovator, a top 100 leadership speaker, and a top 100 most influential author in the world. Doug is founder and CEO of Conant Leadership and chairman of CECP. Now, previously, he served as president of Nabisco, president and CEO of Campbell Soup Company, and chairman of Avon Products. And here is a famous quote that I've used before in presentations that Doug has said, to win in the marketplace, you must first win in the workplace. In my resilience training, I use Doug as an example of gratitude. And we start out the interview talking about this because I'm so curious about some, how, how he can do this. So he wrote 30,000 thank you notes to people at all levels in the organization when he was CEO of Campbell Soup. And here's the kicker. There's only 20,000 people that work there. So he wrote a lot of people got some extra thank you notes and he was very specific. So he talks all about that. You know, then we talk about a little bit about his leadership journey. It got off a little to a rocky start. And then ultimately why he felt called to writing his new book, The Blueprint. And one thing that was very interesting to me, it was just his leadership style and how it evolved over time and how it is today. And one thing I really appreciate about his leadership style is that he cares for people deeply. It's one of his values. But he also cares about business results. I think at times in our effort to become more human or say we need to humanize workplace, which I agree with, I'm not saying I disagree with it, but I think we've forgotten that there's a business to run and the humans support the business. It, it, you know, it, it, it all works together. Let me give a quick plug for his book, The Blueprint. Six Practical Steps to Lift Your Leadership to New Heights. Now, there's so many things I enjoyed about this book because, yes, I read it all. Uh, first of all, it's personal to you. There are so many types of leadership styles. You know, there's transformational, transactional, strategic, uh, authentic, autocratic, democratic. I mean, there's a new leadership course coming out every day. And what I appreciate about this is he's not telling you what kind of leader to be, but rather this blueprint is a step-by-step guide to developing your own leadership style. Because if you imitate somebody else, it's just not going to be helpful. Although you do look in this book, look back at past leaders you admire and would maybe want to incorporate into part of your strategy. 
It's not easy work, but if you're trying to get your footing as a leader or want to be one in the future, if you have time now, and not everyone does, so I get that, just get the book and do the work, or at least start the work. But let's just say you're not ready to do the work, (laughs) which is okay. The second part of the book is really helpful because it walks you through 10 leadership tenets. So that's another thing I really like about it. And it's just very helpful, even if you are a seasoned leader, just to get some reminders about leading. Now, before we dive in, I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, University of Wisconsin Health and Wellness Management, offering online bachelor's and master's degrees in wellness management. You can visit hwm.wisconsin.edu for more information. The graduates of the program have launched successful wellness careers with healthcare systems, wellness program vendors, community agencies, insurance providers, even the military. Here are some really cool things about UW Health and Wellness Management. One, courses are designed and taught by distinguished faculty from the University of Wisconsin, many of whom actively work in the field, which in my opinion is a big plus. Secondly, UW Health and Wellness Management is also supported by an advisory board, industry experts from corporations such as Children's Wisconsin, Willis Towers Watson, and the Wisconsin Department of Employee Trust Funds, who offer advice on changing trends in health and wellness so that students are learning the most up-to-date methods. And third, students often say the flexible online format is a big factor in their ability to earn a degree. And let's talk about our recent situation. It's an indication of the advantages of online learning. Now, although the program is online, you will definitely make strong connections with peers and faculty, just as you would on campus. Let me read you this quote from a recent graduate of the master's program. For a class project in research methods for wellness programs, our team had six people working in three time zones across four states. Each student's career path was different. As a result, everyone brought a unique perspective to the project. Clinical, legal, advocacy, policy, and governmental. It made the project so interesting. UW Health and Wellness Management Bachelor's and Master's Degrees provides the skills you need to manage comprehensive employee well-being programs that foster healthier lifestyles and promote the value of staying well. Turn your passion for wellness into a healthy career with University of Wisconsin Health and Wellness Management. Visit hwm.wisconsin.edu or contact an enrollment advisor by phone at 1-877-895-3276. All of this will be linked up in the show notes. Now, without further ado, I hope you enjoy this interview with Doug Conant. As always, thank you so very much for listening to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. Hello and welcome to Redesigning Wellness, your go-to podcast for making the most of your corporate health strategies. Your host is Jen Arnold, Corporate Wellness Consultant. With over a decade of experience in promoting worksite health, she'll help boost your wellness program to one your employees are sure to enjoy. And now, here's Jen. Doug, welcome to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. I'm so glad to have you on today. Thank you very much. And I want to start out talking, giving you a compliment that you wrote and maybe famous for writing over 30,000 letters of gratitude to people at every level when you were CEO of Campbell Soup. And from what I understand, there were only 20,000 employees at that time. So I'm interested about that. Um, And I actually use you as an example of how you can show gratitude to your workforce in a training that I do. But how did gratitude become such an important part of your leadership philosophy? Well, well, we could spend the entire interview talking about the importance of gratitude, but we're going to work our way through it with dispatch. Uh, Basically, I was, as I chronicled in the book, the first story is about me being fired from a job at the age of 32 years old. Today, I'm 68. So quite quite a few years ago. And uh, when I lost my job, uh, they sent me to an outplacement counselor, a fellow by the name of Neil McKenna. And I must say, that's where I first encountered the notion of creating a signature practice, in my case, it's thank you notes, that communicate to people in a way that works for you, how you really feel about the situations you're engaged in. And so uh, it turned out uh, I was, I was, and still am, although you may not detect it in this interview, uh, a highly introverted fellow. And uh, my outplacement counselor, Neil, said, Doug, you're going to be a horrible interview. 
uh, <laughs> this is going to be hard for you. You've got to think through ways to create breakthrough with the people with whom you're talking that showcase the kind of person you really are. And so one of the ways I decided to do that when I lost my job was if I would go to your building, an office building, and I'd have an interview, I'd get the name of every person that helped me, including the receptionist at the front of the building. And I would get all the names. And then at the end of the day, I would walk to the coffee shop next door and I would handwrite a note each one of those people thanking them specifically for helping me that day in a particular way. Typically, it might be, you know, uh, five to 10 notes of people that I had met. And uh, I would then walk back to the front desk and I would ask the receptionist to have them delivered that day or the next morning. I started doing that. You know, my mother would tell you years earlier, she'd been trying to train me to write thank you notes forever. And I never did it. But when I needed a job, somehow I found the, the, the persistence necessary. But I, I deli- started delivering those notes. And if I was fortunate enough to be called back for another round of interviews, uh, wouldn't you know the receptionist who had never received a thank you note from anybody about anything, remember me, Doug, it's great to have you back. Who are you seeing today? Let me, you know, you better look out for this or that or whatever. And it transformed my experience in that organization. Just the simple act of thanking people genuinely for helping me out that day. So I started to carry that through after I ultimately got a job and I started uh, having work experiences. I started writing thank you notes. Not as frequently as I did at Campbell. When I got to Campbell, it was clear that we needed to be very, that we had a, a toxic work situation where people needed reassurance about what mattered most. And I was always contending it was the people that mattered most and that we couldn't, my first day of work there, I had told them, we can't expect you to value our agenda as a company until we tangibly demonstrate to you that we value your agenda and your contributions as individuals. In my experience, it doesn't work any other way. So I started a practice of writing 10 thank you notes a day and uh, I had a long commute to work, so I, my office would print out everything that had gone on that day off our, our portal and print it out for me, and I would read it on my way home from work. And then when I came in in the morning, I would make it a goal of writing 10 to 20 short notes, thanking people for specific contributions that were actually advancing our agenda. They were either advancing our purpose, our values, or our strategies. And so I started writing these notes and it got to a point where my day didn't feel like it started right unless I'd done those notes. When I retired, I think I was being interviewed. I think it was either for, it was either Forbes or Fortune. And they said, we've heard that you write a lot of notes. How many have you written? We, we didn't know. So we did the math with the reporter in the room. I don't, I wish I could remember who it was 10 years ago and figured out it was a minimum of 30,000 notes over 10 years. And uh, we only did have 20,000 employees. So we're, and, and they were all handwritten, hand signed, delivered right away the next day. So wherever you went in the world, you would find a handwritten note from me in somebody's cubicle stuck up there saying, thanks for your, thanks for helping to deliver this particular project on time under budget. Or thanks for tangibly demonstrating our values or thanks for advancing this diversity and inclusion effort, or whatever it is, or whatever it was. And before you knew it, it became that signature practice for me that gave me the opportunity to touch people in a personal way who I wasn't going to see in, in, but once or twice a year. Mm-hmm. So that's where it started, and that's where it ended. And uh, I still love to write notes. Now they're, e- now they're texts or emails mostly. So no more handwritten notes? So no more handwritten No, there's some. There, there, there mm-hmm. are some, but I'm not, I don't have a, a whole support team in place like I did when I was uh, <laughs> CEO of Campbell. Right. Well, it seemed like it became a practice for you, almost like people exercise in the morning. You wrote your thank you notes. And I think oh. leaders, like when you think about it just as an employee, you rarely even hear a thank you from your boss, much less get a handwritten thank you note from 
you're, you're the CEO of the company. So I, I commend you. That, that. That's something that, that, that's, that speaks to something specific you, you did. I, I was really careful to acknowledge good work. So in a way, I was clarifying our, our agenda mm-hmm. while I was complimenting people. Look, I had maybe three notes from CEOs, and I'm sure I've got them in a box somewhere. Uh, and I did appreciate it. That when I was doing this, uh, society wasn't as in touch with uh, with playing uh, the gratitude card as they are now, and as as and quite frankly, as the culture needs to be going forward, mm-hmm. well, especially yeah, I mean, now. Yes. Yes. Well, you're talking about specific, right? It's very specific to what they did, right? To support the business. And I think, you know, even that when people are giving out of boys or out of girls, it's kind of vague and, hey, you did a great job. But it was also very specific in, in how they supported the business. And I want you, if you could quickly talk about how that got repaid to you when you had your car accident and how you had, because that was, I mean, because I know you didn't yeah. do it to get anything out of it, no. but... Oh, it was, uh, you've done your homework. I, I don't always talk about this, but I have talked about it. Deep into my tenure, about nine years in, uh, July 2nd, 2009, I was in a near fatal car accident. And uh, I still live with the repercussions of that accident today, uh, going on 11 years later. But I was in and out of the hospital. And what was fascinating, my wife was there with me, and every day we'd have a mail run. And they bring mail to the hospital, and we would get uh, reams and reams of cards from people in the company uh, from all over the world, saying, "You you may not remember me, but you know when you, you sent me this note once, and I just want to tell you it was very meaningful to me, and that our, that my family's thoughts and prayers are with you and your family as you try and recover from this horrible accident." And uh, uh, my wife, who was there, and while well, I was just uh, pretty useless at the time, mm-hmm. uh, started made, we have a whole bottom row of a bookcase filled with albums of all the notes that we received from all of our employees. And it was, uh, it, it was, it was important uh, to us as a family and to me as an individual to have somebody put their, to have the organization put their arms around us mm-hmm. and uh, tell us they cared. It was, uh, it was important to actually to my recovery. And, uh, and it's a very meaningful experience. You know, the more you give, the more you get. And, uh, and we didn't give, I wasn't giving all this out. I was giving this to celebrate good work from good people who were doing the best they could. And I wanted them to know I appreciated their performance and I cared. Mm-hmm. And uh, never did I expect it all to come back to me in such a profound and pointed way as when I had that accident. But right. Right. Uh, incredibly, I was incredibly blessed. Yes. And I'm glad that you made it out of that car accident. And, um, most mostly recovered, as you just referred to, maybe not full recovery, but um, yeah, that just shows you that employees will support you not, as the CEO, right, and help support the mission and help support you overall if they care about you personally. Um, and, and I want to kind of take you down a notch, if you will, Doug, <laughs> in a very respectful Good. way, because because we're starting because you you obviously developed into a very strong leader. But I want to make sure everyone knows that you didn't start out that way. And so can you talk about a few of your missteps when you were starting out as a young leader? I'm there. They're chronicled in the book. I lead off the book with getting fired. And, uh, you know, I went to I was an average student athlete. I went to a good school, Northwestern. I then went on to Kellogg graduate school straight away. And uh I had one firm job offer. I took that job with General Mills. I took that job offer, moved to, to Minneapolis where I knew no one. And, uh, and six months into my first uh, assignment, uh, you know, in, in the corporate world, they give you your performance review. And I got ahead an early one because I started at an unusual time. And uh, so six months into my first my first job, my boss did an evaluation of me, which said I was doing a satisfactory job, but I needed to do better. And uh, his boss, every typically the manager's manager needs to sort of sign the 
performance review to say, yeah, that, that this is accurate. So his boss had signed it and he wrote one line underneath and his line was, you should be looking for another job. <laughs> Ouch. And uh, that was my first performance review at General Mills in a state that I didn't know a soul in. All I was doing was working and trying to find my way in, in the corporate jungle. And uh, it was a jarring start. I, I recovered. But then ultimately, I was fired from my job working for General Mills, who at the time owned the Parker Brother Toy and Game Company, which is uh, where I lost my job. And that's the story, the lead story in the book where I went into work one day and uh, the receptionist sent me up to my boss's office. My boss said, Doug, your job has been eliminated. You need to be out of here by noon. And, you know, nine years, almost 10 years of my career was over in a snap. And uh, I had to go home and tell my wife with the two little boys, a baby at home, a dog and two cats. I had, you know, I had to go home and say, I don't have a job. And it was the most devastating day of my career. I have had setbacks all along the way, but I'm sort of a, uh, I love reading uh, sort of cheesy Western novels. My favorite author is Louis L'Amour. And uh, he's written over 110 Western novels. And uh, I've read them all multiple times. I, I can never remember how they end until I get to the ending. But, uh, and he has a great, he has a great line, which sort of speaks to the way I pursued my career. He never knew when he was licked. So he never was. And, uh, and, and so I just kept, I got knocked down. I got up and I just tried to do better. And, uh, but, uh, you know, you know, this, this life, this world, this is not for the faint of heart, you know, and I can say that today, I could have said that before the, the pandemic we're facing today, but this life is not for the faint of heart. You have to pick yourself up and get back in the game mm -hmm. and then find a way to do a little better today than you did yesterday. Uh, that's my philosophy, and, and, and that's sort of how I lived my career. And throughout my book, I talk about the setbacks. Mm -hmm. And any leader, uh, I, every leader has had setbacks. You know, we, we chronicled a, a, a guy I'm a real fan of, Bill George, who, uh, who was a world-class CEO and thought leader on leadership. And uh, he, in, in, in the book, he talks about his shortcomings and his, you know, his, the epiphany he had when he was a very senior leader that he was on the wrong track. Or as uh, Stephen Covey used to tell me, to say, Doug, uh, you know, you're so busy climbing the ladder of success, you don't realize that when he against the wrong wall. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, we all sort of have to shift gears and learn from those experiences and do better. And that's what I try and do. And this whole book is about uh, just uh, getting back up, getting in the game and to trying to do a little better tomorrow than you did today. And, right. uh, and, and that's, that's important. Because that, yes. Well, I, I do feel like sometimes leaders, especially CEOs are seen as these people who don't make mistakes, right? That mistakes are kind of not uncovered as you, you did in the, in the book and talked about them. And also with your attention to and importance of a growth mindset and learning from those, those mistakes or failures. And so when you look at your career, like kind of what made you feel called to write this book, the blueprint, like what, what got into you that said, I, I need to put a leadership book out into the world? Well, I, I, I embarked on my own journey. My first decade of my career, I was sort of just keeping my head down, staying in my cubicle, trying to do my job. And uh, then I lost my job. And then all of a sudden, I needed to lift my head up and figure out how am I going to make this work with that outplacement concert, Neil McKenna. And then for the last 35 years following that experience, I've been uh, really a student of leadership. And, uh, uh, and, I've been observing leaders, observing people, working with pe shoulder to shoulder with so many good, well-intentioned people. I mean, countless numbers. And my observation has been all along that uh, most people want to do well and they want to contribute and they want to be better today than they were yesterday. But they are feeling stuck. 
I feel that's more true now than ever before because the world has become more challenging than ever before, even before uh, our current global pandemic. Uh, my my mentor, one of my mentors, Warren Bennis from uh, California, where he was at USC, uh, coined the term in the 80s, uh, a VUCA world, mm-hmm. volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And that was in 1987. Today, it's a VUCA world on steroids. <laughs> it's incredibly volatile, incredibly uncertain, incredibly complicated, and incredibly ambiguous. And leaders want to contribute, but it's so hard to find a way to do it and so hard to find a way to get better. We're all swamped. We all feel as if we're getting a sip of water from the fire hydrant of life. We have more things on the to-do list than we're ever going to get done. At work, if we don't know what to do, it used to be when I started, I would go ask my boss. Well, today, your boss doesn't know your job. We flattened it out so that bosses, their span of control is much wider. And they don't know the depth of what's required to get the job done. So you're expected to figure it out on your own. And then all of a sudden, you're besieged with emails, text messages, phone calls, meetings. And then you get a call from school that says, Johnny's not doing well. Can somebody come pick him up? And, and, and you go pick him up and you go back to work. And then you go back home, make dinner, and then you get on email again. And uh, so today's leaders are just besieged with challenges. And they're saying, I want to do more, but I just, I'm stuck. And as we got into it, we found a way to help people get unstuck, which is by making this a bite-sized leadership improvement process that anybody can follow. Now, it took me 40 years to figure it out. So, and I'm slow, (laughs) uh, which is why I got that poor review my first six months in. But we have found a way to make this approachable and fulfilling. And uh, that's what the blueprint is all about, helping people get unstuck. And what we know about change is that you can't change in a vacuum. You have to be able to change in the context of your everyday life. My wife and I might be talking about diets after the holidays, right? And uh, we're going to, we're going to lose 20 pounds each. And so, uh, By week one, we're being really good. By week two, we're starting to slip. And by the end of January, forget about it. Uh, We, you know, we're on to something else because that diet didn't fit perfectly in our cockamamie life. What I do know about leadership development and change is your change process has to fit perfectly in your cockamamie life, or you won't be able to engage in it in an in an earnest or consistent way. So uh, that's what we're, that's what this is all about. Yeah, Doug, and I want to impress upon my listeners that I I really love the blueprint because it's not prescriptive. And I think that a lot of leadership out there, you know, there's like authentic leadership and there's, you know, I'm blanking on all the different types of leadership models out there, right? And I love this because it is really personal to you and, and people going through it. You create your own leadership model, which will help guide them. Their, as you say. Well, yeah. I mean, our, our perspective is that your your life story is your leadership story, and you're unique. And the key to you being effective in the workplace is tapping into your uniqueness in a way that helps you show up with greater authenticity, but also have impact in the culture you're working in. And the only way to deal with all that, the only way to 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 uh, to, to break out of that is to go deep within and tap into the, your your core beliefs about leadership, and then to build your own personal leadership model. You know, all I I know hundreds of leaders, uh, five different presidents, uh, lots and lots of leaders. They're all different, mm-hmm. and as as I look at it, I say, well, what's the, what's the similarity? Well, their life story has informed their leadership story. They have a set of core beliefs that are guiding them through all this that it, and a sense of purpose with what they're doing that transcends the ordinary. And what, we're help, what we want to do is help every aspiring leader create their own sense of purpose, gather their core beliefs, build a model, a leadership model, and we talk about how to do that, 
that speaks to them in a powerful and unique way. And then what's really important is bringing that model to life with practices like my thank you notes, Mm -hmm. where all of a sudden you start showing up as the person you want to show up as, as opposed to the person your boss wants you to show up as, or some leadership book has told you to show up this way. We want you to show up in a way that speaks to you. And uh, so everyone's different. I've taught this, this philosophy about build your own leadership model to well over a thousand people. And, uh, and I'll tell you, we have over a thousand different leadership models. No two are the same mm-hmm. yeah. because no two people are the same. No two people have the same identical aspirations, the same identical life story, the, the same identical circumstance. So uh, we help these people sort of devise their own model. The other thing about this process is to do it, you forget perfection. It's never right. Uh, A lot of people I work with are perfectionists. They want to be perfect. I wanted to be perfect when I started doing this kind of work with Stephen Covey back in the 90s, 80s and 90s. Type type Uh, A overachiever, right? Of course, you want the Yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do the best (laughs) mission statement you ever saw in the seven habits. And uh, and then I saw Stephen a year later. He said, well, did you show it to your wife yet? I said, no, I'm still working on it. It's not perfect. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's when he straightened me out on that one and said, share it with her. This is a process. It's not an end result. Mm-hmm. And so uh, with this work that we do, people have a sense of purpose. They have some core beliefs. They build their model. They develop some practices. Some work, some doesn't. And then we have them iterate through this in high, at high speed in a way that fits into their life, however they choose to do it. We give them a roadmap for doing it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it just gets better and better and better. And it, it's like all of a sudden you get to a crisis, a pandemic. You say, OK, what matters most here? And you go back to your purpose. Forget the, the, the agenda of the enterprise because that's up in the air now. What matters most? Well, the two things that matter most to me are about people and performance. And I go back to my model, which is also in the book. And I say the first thing I want to do is honor people. The second thing is inspire trust. And the third thing is be real clear about what my higher purpose is here. And then here's how I want to lead the organization through this. I can, you know, I can encounter any situation in a nanosecond and start to chart a course because I've done the work up front. So I know what matters most to me. So and, uh, so talk, I, talk about that purpose a little bit, because you, you've mentioned it a few times. You just put it in there with honor yeah. people, inspire trust and purpose, because yeah. sometimes in today's world, people can see it as woo woo. Right. Leaders are like, oh, purpose, values, all this stuff. So, talk, well, I mean, you just hit home with well, the pandemic, this pandemic. But, it, yeah, this pandemic is real helpful in that regard, because, you know, most people, uh, organizations and I work with the federal government, I work with academia. And I work with uh, companies. Most organizations tend to migrate towards managing tasks, strategies, tactics, and tasks, right? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you have a global pandemic and all the strategies change and all the tactics change and all the tasks change. Uh, What we're finding in this environment is what really matters is the higher purpose. What matters most to the enterprise here? And that is what knits everything together for everyone in the enterprise. The same thing is true for an individual. Well, at Campbell Soup, we were trying to nourish people's lives. We were a soup company. We were trying to nourish people's lives everywhere, every day. And we were nourishing all of our stakeholders. We were focusing on uh, the concept of nourishing was was built into the, our enterprise and how we dealt with all of our stakeholders and our employees. My thank you notes were nourishing employees' lives. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, and so the strategies and tactics and leaders could come and go, but we were in the nourishing business. And it provided a touchstone for every employee in that company. I think the same thing is true with purpose. Uh, I have an ex- elaborate purpose today because I've been working in this territory forever. And uh, every word in my purpose statement speaks to me. My purpose statement is I intend to help people help build high high performance, high trust, high performance teams 
that honor people, defy the critics, and thrive in the face of adversity. Every one of those words means something to me. Mm-hmm. It, it is my true north. You know, but I've worked on this for a while. People I might start with, look, they, I, they could say, uh, my purpose is to serve others and be a good steward for my family. You know, mm-hmm. that's a good start. Okay, well, if you want to serve others and be a good steward for your, for your family, how are, what, are, what are your beliefs about how do you need to lead to do that? And you spend time on that. And, and we take you through a process, a very simple process in the book to do that. And uh, all of a sudden, you have a purpose of serving others and being a good steward for your family. You have some beliefs about that. And then you say, okay, how am I going to show up and do that effectively at work? And we help you build a model. We help you identify practices that you want to have. And the one thing we know about that process, which quite frankly, end to end probably takes 12 hours worth of work, Mm -hmm. 12 hours, not 12 years, not 12 hours spread out over a month. All of a sudden you have a foundation to build on. And you you iterate through it again. Well, how's that purpose holding up? I've been doing this for a month. And I, don't, I think I can do better. And then what beliefs are really striking a chord? And what should I maybe drop? Is my model working? Are my practices working? And we create this highly iterative process, which is never perfect, but it starts with purpose. What are you doing this for? You have a choice. You're choosing to be a leader. And you're doing it because... You want to provide for your family and you want to have a career. That's, I'm sure, part of it. You're also doing it because you care about the people you work with. Uh, You want to serve them in a way that meets their needs uh, so that they'll give you all they've got while you're leading them. And uh, as we as we wrestle with those ideas, uh, we find leaders become more clear. Mm -hmm. I have a woman who's. uh, I mean, she's got the world. She's provost of NYU University right now. Can you imagine what a mess that is right now in Mm -hmm. New York City? Mm -hmm. And her leadership model, which we're going to be putting up on our website that she designed, was that of a boat trying, way before this ever happened, of a boat trying to navigate some rough seas. Hmm. And and, she shared an email with me. Uh, not maybe three weeks ago, she said, I never had any idea what a powerful tool this was going to be for me because I've got my rudder in the water and I know where I'm going and I know how I intend to behave. And, uh, and that's what we want to help all leaders do so that when the seas get rough, which they will, Yes, always. These leaders can have their rudder in the water, starting with purpose. I want to serve. I want to be a good steward for my family. I want to advance my career, and I want to serve others. Right, and, and I think, uh, and even if there's not, that's a, important. Right, and even if there's not a pandemic for another leader after this, there's always going to be hard times. So yes, having this model, oh that, or, I mean, she must be so thankful that she's gone through these exercises and have that has that strong leadership capacity in place um, as they're going. We, we work with. We work with lots of leaders, actually, uh, in the New York hospital system who are, uh, I mean, this is just, uh, nobody ever imagined this. And, uh, and I guarantee you, uh, they're relying on those models to help them really be true to themselves and have uh, a constructive impact, impact with others under duress. The time you need to do this work, by the way, is before you have the crucible moment. Mm-hmm. And that we make that point in the book too. The time to do this is when you're not in the stormy seas, but when you're in the calm seas and you can step back and you can reflect on what matters most and you can actually start to codify it and yeah. start to organize it in a way that works for you, not yeah, for me, for you. Right. And so that when the storm comes, you'll be ready for it. Right. And as you the said, it, it, the, it will come. <laughs> it will come. Now, yeah. And, and, Doug, I do, I do, because we're running out of time. I don't know how this is going so quickly, but <laughs> I want to get to another theme that I, that I really got from the book, and it was really about what I think a lot of leaders struggle with, and it's one that I know in my early leadership, and I still do struggle with this, is, is being tough-minded on standards and tender-hearted on people. And it, for me, it's always, I'm either one, or, I lean one way too hard and then the other. It's hard to find that balance. 
And I think especially for young leaders, at least, they forget about the people, right? Um, So I guess two questions here. Why people first? I'm just going to ask that. Like, why should CEOs, why should leaders consider people first? Uh, Forget CEO. I mean, I can talk about CEO. Most people aren't going to be CEOs. But uh, if you've got a work group of five people, probably 80% of the work is going to be done by those people when you're not in the room. And by the time you hear about it, it's going to have been done, reimagined in a way that it's going to make perfect sense to you, even if it doesn't. You are totally, as a leader, you are totally dependent on other people to get the job done. Now, if you, as soon as you acknowledge that dependence, which it is, and I've lived it, you know, most of my life I was working for, I wasn't a CEO. I was a fledgling manager who got fired, you know. And so I, I, I know what I'm talking about here. I've lived it. You're dependent on all these people. And in my experience, if you want them to care about your agenda as a leader, they damn well better believe you, you care about their agenda as an individual. And you're, you're at risk if they think you don't care. Uh, so, and so what I've come to believe is it's a people first approach. The def- my definition of leadership is the act of uh, influencing others in a specific direction. If you want to influence them and have them representing your best interests when you're not in the room, not when you are in the room, then you have to have their hearts and minds fully engaged. If you want to get their hearts and minds fully engaged, you damn well better care. Mm-hmm. And if you don't, you're at risk. You know, that's just that's my experience. It's a people first game. Without people, you can't get anything done. I don't care if you're president of the United States or a CEO or a manager of a distribution center. You're totally dependent on others. And if you want them to serve you well, they damn well better believe that you're going to serve them well. Wait, uh, it it's, seems it's, to like, me, it's just common sense. <laughs> That's exactly what I was about to say. It seems like common sense, but why do so many leaders miss that human element? Because, well, because, yeah, because people first. Yeah, as we talked earlier, we tend to be, organizations tend to be great critical thinking machines and not great critical feeling machines. Mm-hmm. We tend to, uh, I mean, you, I can go into an organization and see a spreadsheet and see what's wrong. I'm trained to look at things and find what's wrong and then fix them. And that tends to be what happens with most organizations. So we tend to look for what's wrong and then we tend to fix it and we tend to become very task focused. And we tend to take our eye off the ball. And the ball has to be on the people who have to manage all those tasks. Uh, As a leader, your job is not to do the task. Your job is to make sure you've got the best possible team, best imaginable team, managing all the tasks. And if you want the best imaginable players, they if you want the best, they're going to have to choose to work with you and choose to represent you well. So... That's the caring side, and and I call it tough-minded on standards and tender-hearted with people. But there's another side of the coin. The other side of the coin is you do have to perform. You know, any job you take, uh, this is the deal. At the most, you got three years. The first year, it's the other guy's fault. The second year, it's our fault, but we're learning and we're getting better. The third year, you own it. And so, uh, I think when you go into these any job, you got to assume that that you're going to have to own these decisions and you don't have a lot of time to get traction. So you better make sure that you're performing well. You've got to be meeting or exceeding standards and you have to make sure the organization is focused on that as well. So you do have to be hitting the standards. I have found it's a whole lot easier to hit the standards if I have everybody working with me and and fully engaged in the work and they're being there because they want to be as opposed to they have to be my odds of success are much higher right uh so there there are two certainties you have to perform and you have to and you have to pay attention to the people i i just you can get elected for four years in this country and not be particularly talented tolerant of people but it's a slippery slope Mm-hmm. And uh, I think and I, that's true of, of every organization. And I do think it's a little bit of an, I don't know, an art or a science or experience, because I think that whenever 
people say that they're tender hearted with people, it tends to be like, you're too easy on people. You know, you kind of let them get away with oh. things and it's, it's not right. <laughs> or it's both. No, no, you can't be right. Your how do you standards are that? actually higher. So how do you, so just kind of give me just a little snippet on like, how do you hold people accountable? Because that's imperative, right? You have to do your job. Right. At the end of the day, you deliver results, but you're still tender hearted with people. Because I imagine that you had people over your career that wanted to work for you. They were totally engaged, but they were missing the mark. Well, then they were in the wrong job and we had to help them find the right way to contribute. We had to get the job done. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it had to be a win-win. It has to be a win for the enterprise and a win for the individual. And if it's not, we've got to help that individual find a way to contribute that will work. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, 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 when I went to Campbell, we were a troubled company. Uh, and, uh, uh, in my first three years, we turned over 300 of the top 350 leaders of the company. Wow. And I don't believe there's another Fortune 500 company that's been through that much change at any one point in time. But we needed to make changes. A lot of people were reassigned to other areas. What was interesting was that employee engagement went up every year. We made those changes because all the employees knew we needed to make some changes. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just most leaders are not. Uh, tough-minded enough to hold people accountable, give them time to contribute. We did this over a three-year period, my three-year rule. and uh, But in three years, we made sizable changes. Uh, and and so there's a tough-mindedness to this that has to be there. But you can still care about people. It's just not working. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I'm sorry. And we got to find a way to make it work. And we got to make sure if you're leaving the company, you're going to find another job. We and we're going to be committed to helping you do that. You know, in my case, I had twenty thousand employees. I had to make tough calls on the top three hundred and fifty, but I had another nineteen thousand six hundred and fifty people that were counting on me mm-hmm. to get the leadership right, so they'd be in good shape. Right. So uh, there yeah. was a greater good there that had to be served. Right. Now, what did you mean by my three-year rule? Was that just something you put in place? My three-year rule. I mean, you've got three years, uh, Mm -hmm. and if you either you've got three years, your first year it's the other guy's fault, the second year it's our fault, the third year it's your fault. So you got three years to get your act together, get your team together, get positive momentum, get everybody engaged, and anybody that says they can do it faster than that, I'd, I'd love to really look under the hood of that car. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think it's possible because, you know, Stephen Covey had a great line. He said, Doug, you can't talk your way out of something you behaved your way into. You just got to behave your way out of it. And organizations, when you go into a job, typically you go, a lot of times you go into a job because something needs to change. And so there's been some kind of behavior that's not working. You can't change, but in my opinion, you can't change behavior in an enduring way overnight. It takes time. You can you can assert yourself and you can demand a certain style, but that is a long walk of, off a short pier. And as soon as you turn your back, you can be risking alienating your group in a way that isn't going to serve you well. Mm-hmm. So uh, this whole process of being tough-minded and tender-hearted, it's an art and a science. I talk about leadership as being sacred ground. Look, you're affecting people's lives and you better damn well treat it as if it's sacred ground because it is, in my opinion. Well, it's almost like they should uh, hire you into leadership roles that way because I know when I became a a leader, it was more of promotion. It was more about, but it was was less about sacred ground. And so I like how you said that, that if we could introduce leadership that way instead of it just being a promotion or an advance for that individual. And, and more about well, the- you know, I'm just trying to get people to think about how important this is to the mm-hmm. people they're they're working with, their colleagues, the people they're serving, their right. their stakeholders. You know, you're affecting people's lives, and 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 if you're not taking it seriously, you're you're at risk that they're not going to take your agenda very seriously either. They're just going to show up when they have to, as opposed as opposed to being there because they want to. Mm-hmm. So. Doug, I, I can't believe that we're almost out of time. <laughs> so did get to like half my, I mean, I'm assuming there is a cutoff here at, at uh, two o'clock. So, or three o'clock your time. So I want to be yeah. respectful of your time. Okay. 
when you think about your book, your, your leadership mm-hmm. career and everything that we've talked about today, if leaders walked away from this interview with one thing they can take away to start today, aside from reading your book, because we think they should do that, but, you know, especially given the times we're facing today, what would that be? I, I, I think, you know, uh, I think your life story is your leadership story. And I think most leaders don't, don't sufficiently examine their life story, which will inform their purpose, their core beliefs about leadership, and they can do better. And they owe it to themselves to examine their life story, learn from it, and start to bring it forward into their life as a leader. The only way to get unstuck in leadership, in my opinion, the only way out is in. Go inside, reflect on what your life learnings are, and begin to have them more strongly influence the way you show up in the workplace. Your life story is your leadership story. Beautifully stated. Well, Doug, where can people find out more about the blueprint, more about you and your organization? Well, uh, we, we at our website, Conant Leadership, uh, you can click on the blueprint. We have a lot of information on the blueprint. We have some we we have uh, leadership models actually flowing into our website these days from people who are doing the work, and, and you'll see how different every leadership model is. It's kind of interesting. You can also. On the website, you can learn more about uh, uh, about my personal leadership philosophy called the Conan Leadership Flywheel. And so you have you you get some ideas there. But the best thing to do is go to the website. The book is available wherever business books are sold, so you'll find it. I will link all of that up in the show notes. And Doug, before we end today, is there anything you want to leave my listeners with that perhaps I didn't ask you or we didn't get a chance to touch on today? Well, I am going to try and do this in two minutes. Uh, the second half of the book, I talk about what I call the 10 foundational tenets of, for leadership that works in the 21st century. These are my perspective. This is my perspective. I talk about 10 important things, two of which I would highlight right now. And I think the first one is the importance of courage in, uh, on this journey. And uh, Maya Angelou has a, a wonderful quote on courage. She basically says, uh, of all virtues, courage is the most important because without courage, you can't practice any other virtues with consistency and purpose. And so how do you develop courage as a leader? You develop courage by becoming incredibly well anchored in how you want to approach things and in your leadership journey. If you're well anchored, you'll have the courage of your convictions. and You'll be able to lead with much more impact. So courage is important. The second thing I would talk about is the importance of fun. Mm-hmm. Conan O'Brien has a great quote. Uh, uh, one of my favorites, work hard, have fun, and amazing things will happen. You can enjoy this journey. You can start to show up more the way you want to show up, and you can have fun along the way. You can do those two things. They are not mutually exclusive. And so uh, uh, we encourage people to engage in this journey with a sense of purpose, with the current uh, sense of purpose of developing the courage of their convictions, and then they have fun along the way. It, this is We're incredibly blessed in many ways in this country, and uh, there's an opportunity to really enjoy the ride, and we encourage aspiring leaders to do just that. Right. Well, thank you for bringing fun back into it because, you know, our careers are long and we should have some fun. So <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned that out of the 10, that that was, that was two. And I think people can really dig into those other eight and uh, see what resonates with them. All right. uh, Doug, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Happy to help. Enjoyed the conversation. One of the things I frequently hear from wellness professionals is that they want a tribe. They want to find their people. In other words, a place where they can express their opinion without getting chastised for it and where they can get support when they're butting up against the old wellness paradigm. If you're looking for that safe space, come and join us in the Redesigning Wellness community on Facebook. To find us, you can just go to Facebook and in the search bar, type Redesigning Wellness Community and it'll pop right up. You'll just have to answer a couple questions and I'll let you right in. I'd love to see you there.